Success Insider, a premium edition of the Financial Sense News Hour. Today's host is Senior Editor Chris Sheridan. Peter Zion joins us on the show today. His most recent book is Disunited Nations, The Scramble for Power in an Ungoverned World, where, Peter, you talk about some of the chaos and disruption that we're likely to see in the years and decades ahead and how energy also fits into this equation, which is something that you've also written about extensively in your other books as well. So with that said, let's start with the area where we're currently seeing plenty of disruption and debate, especially when it comes to energy and climate. And that's what recently happened in Texas, a place that I believe you live for close to 20 years, I understand. That is correct. I just moved about a year and a half ago. You know, one of the, the big selling points for Texas consistently is low cost of living. You know, there's no income tax. Uh, the weather is balmy. So normally you don't need climate control except for in the heat of the summer. Uh, and because it is a wind state and a solar state and an oil state and a natural gas state and a coal state, electricity prices are consistently among both the lowest in the country and the most steady. So what happened last week is just out of proportion by any way you look at it. You know, Peter, we've heard a number of different people, high profile individuals like Elon Musk and businesses that have moved their operations or their home location to Texas, particularly Austin. But given how massive this power outage was, something that was largely unthinkable, do you think that this event was significant enough to change the calculus for many individuals and businesses going forward when it comes to a lot of the inbound migration that Texas has seen over the past several years? I still think that Texas is going to be the U.S. state that benefits the most from changes that are happening both in the country and around the world as regards to demographics and infrastructure and the power transition and deglobalization. All of it still bodes very, very well for the state. But having $50 billion of damage in a four-day period because of a power failure, that definitely takes some of the shine off the story. And if you're a manufacturer and you were looking to move to Texas because everything was low cost, you know, that's great. But if the electricity doesn't stay on, you have to factor that into your math. And so you're talking insurance, you're talking winterization costs that perhaps you weren't thinking were necessary. All of a sudden, it's obvious that they are necessary. And none of that's free. Now, you recently wrote about this, and I thought it was very interesting, your view and take on this complex situation. I mean, you basically write that, as we all know, the political narratives came in really, really quick to this. You know, the, yeah. <laughs> yeah, before we even got good data, the political narratives were there. Very oh, yeah. Reliable. Right. So you have the anti-green narrative and you've got the anti-fossil fuel narrative. What is your take on the situation? Well, we had a broad scale failure across the system. It is true what the anti-green folks say, that the wind turbines got too much ice on them and stopped spinning. Uh, it is true what the anti-fossil fuel groups said, that we had production problems because water was freezing in the natural gas pipelines, which caused blockages, which led that part of the system to fail. But this, the common point here isn't that it was one or the other and it wasn't ideological. The point here is that Texas just didn't winterize because this kind of weather just doesn't happen normally. This is at at a minimum, a once in a decade activity and probably more a once in a generation activity. And so Texas just made the decision collectively that we will not prepare for this specific outcome because we find it so unlikely to ever really happen. Well, now it has happened. And we're going to have to winterize everything from the wind turbines to the natural gas pipelines to the refineries to the pipes in people's homes. You know, this is going to be, this, the cost of this is going to run into the billions, probably the tens of billions. There's going to be two big pressures for this. Uh, one is going to come from the private sector, because can you imagine what insurance for your home is going to be if you haven't winterized now? It's going to apply to all new constructions, because otherwise the insurance cost will simply be unbearable. Now, these are things that will pay for themselves. Uh, in the 20 years that I was in Texas, we never had anything like this, but we had the odd power outages that were weather induced. And every once in a while we had pipes freeze. But since it happened to the whole state, uh, private insurers are going to demand the changes and they're going to happen. The second thing to keep in mind is that the city in Texas that was hit most strongly by the power outages, the price surges, uh, the water outages was none other than Austin, the capital. Uh, and even if the governor and the legislature of Texas do nothing, you can bet that the bureaucrats who are actually in charge of keeping the system running are going to change or reinterpret the regulatory structure to force winterization so that this doesn't happen again. A key thing to remember about Texas that is both a plus and a minus, the constitution of Texas forbids 
the legislature, but to meet once every other year, only for two months, and they're constitutionally prohibited from picking up legislation during half of that time. So you shouldn't look to the legislature to solve this problem. You should look to the people who actually manage the day-to-day -day events in Texas. And that includes the power sector, the, the railroad commission, which is the, the, the state regulatory body that runs the, the state's petroleum interests is not managed by the legislature. So you've got these independent poles of power that are gonna be making decisions on this completely independent of the political system. So to go back to what you said earlier, we saw that everything went down, not just renewable energy and wind turbines, but also the natural gas, the coal, even the nuclear, right? All of the non-intermittent sources of energy, which that's what should not happen. And you think that we are going to see wide sweeping winterization of all of these things. There's going to be costs associated with that. What is your take on the future growth of renewables, though? Because it seems like you're writing that this is not going to put a dent in renewable sources is actually going to lead to further growth in that area. Why is that? Absolutely. We've got three things that are going on independently that are kind of creating the perfect storm for an explosion of wind power in particular in Texas. Uh, the first is that seasonally, uh, wind power is not as good in Texas as it is in the summer. The, the winds just tend to be weaker. But we have newer wind turbines that are coming online that are pushing 600 feet tall from the base. And as wind turbines get bigger, the amount of power that they generate increases exponentially compared to their cost of installation because they're able to tap stronger and more reliable wind currents. So as these new towers come online, a lot of that winter deficit goes away and a lot of the intermittency that we've associated correctly with green tech goes away. And wind in Texas is already providing baseload power at 400 feet. So you increase that to 600 feet and it's kind of a no brainer. Uh, second, wind power is now becoming cost effective in Texas without the subsidy structure at all. So it's just a question of reliability and volume, and that has nothing to do with the political situation. Texas utilities are now looking at wind power as a reliable source of power. And that's gonna be doubled down because of the third factor in that winterizing a wind turbine requires one of two things, heating elements in the blades or a local drone port that can carry a de-icing capacity and spray down the blades. Now, neither of those are free, but neither of those are overly expensive. And since we now have wind towers that are generating like three megawatts each, you don't have to do it all that many places. Compare that to the cost of winterizing a century of legacy fossil fuel infrastructure across the state. I mean, you're talking about something that in total is going to be like two or three percent the cost of doing this to the legacy industry. And so if you're a power producer and you have to make a, or a power buyer, and you have to make a choice between investing in wind power that is going to be more reliable in the midterm and maybe even cheaper, or winterizing infrastructure that is not just years, but decades old, you know, it's, it's a cost question. And since natural gas has proven to be not quite as reliable as we thought it was two weeks ago, that's got to figure into your math. And all of a sudden, wind is looking like the smart choice for a lot of players. Does that mean everyone's going to go 100% win? Of course not. That'd be asinine. But the balance of interests, the, uh, the culture change is absolutely happening with Texas utilities now seeing wind as a bigger part of their future than they thought it was two weeks ago. Well, it's interesting because Texas has been thought of as a fossil fuel state, right, with just the amount of oil and gas that they produce. And yet at the same time, they are pushing full bore into renewable energy. And I believe renewable energy accounts for, what, around 25 percent of their energy production? That sounds about right. Almost all of that is wind and almost all of that is new in just the last three years. Uh, one of the big misconceptions about Texas is something you just said, that it's a fossil fuel state. I don't know. That's not what Texas is. What Texas is, is a state that does things that make sense. And when it comes to economics and when it comes to the power grid, they don't do it for ideological reasons. So when Texas went into wind, it was because the technology was ready. It wasn't because of any big ideological push. And I think we're, what we're going to see over the next five years is solar for Texas is now about to be ready because peak demand for cooling in Texas roughly lines up with peak uh, 
solar supply hours. One of the problems that a lot of states have had is that their peak power demand is between 6 p.m. and 10 p.m. in the winter, but peak supply for solar electricity is between 11 a.m. and 3 p.m. in the summer. Well, that's not the case in Texas. Texas not only is further south, so it has a longer window of peak supply, but normally in Texas, peak demand is during that same window in the summer. So there's a lot more opportunities for good overlap without needing a supplementary battery system to do storage. It just makes more sense now that the costs have come down. So the first American major metro that is likely to go 100% green is Dallas-Fort Worth. And I don't think there's an environmentalist in that town. What's fascinating about this is what we see taking place in Texas with, you know, recovering from this and obviously what we saw last week, that this is part of, this is kind of a microcosm of what we see taking place around the U.S., if not around the globe, when it comes to the intersection of energy, climate, and an aging, dilapidated infrastructure. You know, something that we've discussed on our show many times, and as you know as well, as American Civil Society of Engineers gives... U.S. infrastructure D plus, you know, that's just one grade up from from an F. So we need to be doing something about that. And here we see in Texas, all of these things coming together in a massive, like you said, perfect storm. Well, let me first kind of dissect the, uh, the idea of dilapidated infrastructure. It's not that it's wrong, but it's not entirely accurate either. Uh, unlike most countries, the United States is federal. So we've got a balance of power between the national state and local authorities which means that when it comes to electricity generation and transmission, most of it is done at the local level. So each individual municipality generally has its own local utility. And then you might have a super local regional power producer and transmitter uh, that, happen, that happens to link a bunch of cities together. We do technically have three grids in the United States, the Eastern and the Western interconnection and the Texas grid, but most of the power is consumed and produced locally. That's not how it happens in most of the world. There's a single French grid. There's only like a few Russian grids. There's a single British grid. Uh, there, the power of the state is concentrated into a single political and economic capital, and they determine how things go. That's just not how we are, which means that when you're dealing with a city of 40,000 people, they probably have their own power board, and they're probably not up to date on the best technology. One of the things that we are going to see as green power becomes more economically viable is an entrenchment of that in the United States. Because the places where solar and wind make sense are going to be non-point generations within a single community. So Texas is the perfect example. It's a windy state. It's a sunny state. And the wind isn't far from the population centers, and the sun isn't far from the population centers. You add in a little local generation and things like rooftop solar, and you can have 100 times as many generation facilities in the footprint where people are actually living. And that means that the Texas grid might actually be the best set up in the country for what's coming. But if you move out of places that are windy and sunny, the math changes completely. So if you're in New York City, you know, a vertical city, solar's pointless. Not only is it a relatively cloudy part of the country and the solar radiation is on average a fifth of what it is in Texas, it's more seasonal. And since people live literally stacked on top of one another, putting solar panels on roofs isn't going to do jack. The population is just too concentrated. That means you have to build solar farms or wind farms hundreds, maybe even thousands of miles away from the cities and have high voltage lines that carry it in. So we're going to get this weird bifurcation across the entire power sector where places in the Midwest can have locally generated power. And I'm sorry, not the Midwest, the Great Plains. And places in the Southwest can have locally generated solar power. But for the rest of the country, you're going to need wires that just stretch forever. And the legal system of the United States is not well set up for that. We've seen how much trouble we have running pipelines or high voltage lines from state to state to state. There's a overlap in authorities between state and federal and everybody's arguing over that. But when the geography of your power generation overlaps with your geography of power demand, this just goes away. And that's where Texas is. So it's been a rough week. There's no way around that. But if you fast forward this 10 years, I have no doubt that Texas is going to be the number one green state when it comes to generation. It already is in wind. 
And you had said earlier that you believe Texas is going to be one of the main beneficiaries of some of the larger trends that you're looking at. Can you give us an idea of why that is? A couple big things. Uh, first of all, demographics. The global population is in the state of aging and shrinking, but the United States is a partial exemption for that. Our baby boomers actually had children. And as a result, uh, our population is relatively stable and growing. Within the United States, the people are starting to move around uh, in part because of coronavirus, in part because of the baby boomer retirement, and in part because the millennials are wanting homes that they can afford. And this is surging people into Texas left, right, and center. So Texas is probably going to be the state with the healthiest demography out of a country that has among the healthiest demographies in the world. That's great for the workforce, that's great for consumption, that's great for the tax base. Looking more broadly, as the United States withdraws from the wider world, the world is in a situation where the, uh, the ties that bind are breaking down. Because without the Americans providing security to the world, trade is more problematic. Security for things like energy exports and imports is more problematic. But none of this really bothers the United States. And the more you disrupt the global system and the supply chains that come from that, the more that investors who are looking to put their money where there's stability and growth are going to be looking to North America. And Texas has Mexico right next door. The Mexican demography is just about as stable as the American demography, and they're now latched at the hip because of NAFTA. So you can have an energy secure, manufacturing secure, consumption secure system in North America that it becomes the envy of the world, even as everything else just kind of breaks down. And Texas is in the heart of all of it. So even though Texas is facing this short-term problem, and likely there will be increased costs from having to winterize, even with that said, Texas is still seeing a bright future, and likely people are going to be continuing to move there, as we've seen in considerable droves over the years. No doubt whatsoever. Even though you moved from Texas to Denver. <laughs> <laughs> do what I say, not what I do. <laughs> no, it's, I didn't move to Denver for a job. My job is mobile. I, I moved to Denver for the mountains. And there's not a lot of those in Texas. Well, Peter, with that said, it's a pleasure speaking with you on our show. If any of our listeners would like to follow more of your work, I know you produce some excellent newsletters. Again, the most recent book you've written is Disunited Nations. I definitely want to recommend that all of our listeners pick that up. But what's the best way to sign up for your newsletter and follow more of your work? Uh, best way to go is to the website, zeihan.com slash newsletter. It's free. It is always free. And then, of course, I'm on Twitter at Peter Zion. Well, Peter, it was a pleasure speaking with you again. We look forward to having you on in the future. The Financial Sense News Hour is for informational and educational purposes only and should not be considered as a solicitation or offer to purchase or sell any securities. The investments, investment strategies, and investment philosophies discussed or presented on the News Hour each involve their own unique risk factors, which are not discussed on the show. Responses to listener inquiries are based on the personal opinions of the Financial Sense staff and do not take into account listener suitability, objectives, or risk tolerance. Financial Sense News Hour and its parent company shall not be liable for any financial losses that result from investing in any companies mentioned in financial sense or arising out of the use of any material on the news hour. Be advised that you invest at your own risk.